Uh, we've got a double act coming up next um, from Etienne Zaninotto and Peter Britton. So Etienne is Programme Director of the Agile Scale Transformation with Société Générale Investment Banking. Prior to this appointment, Etienne has led, several various, has led various transformation teams and programs within the investment banking front office and the risk departments, lastly as COO of the front office CBA desk. Peter Britton is Vice President of Fidelity and Architecture Chapter Area Leader for Technology and Strategy within the Fidelity Personal, Personal Investing Business Unit. Within the, that unit, Peter has overall responsibility for the technology, architectural strategies, and solutions architectures operationalized within the domains, tribes, squads, and functional areas, which are the constituent components of the personal investment agile operating model. Peter is a member of the Enterprise Technology Advisory Group, the TAG, whose primary responsibility is execution of the Fidelity CIO Council agenda, combined with the establishment of broad technology strategies and standards across Fidelity. The TAG is comprised of all of the CTOs and heads of architecture. And uh, as I say, the, the presentation today will be on uh, scaling agile lessons learned. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. I will, uh, I will hand over to whoever is going first, but a warm welcome from the open group virtually, please, for, for Etienne and Peter. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to talk to you today, and thank you to invite me for, for this t testimony of the uh, transformation that we are still uh, following at, at the investment banking of Société Générale. So uh, today I will talk, uh, I will do a quick introduction, then I will explain the, the transformation that we've made to, to move to an agile scale model, uh, and then uh, a few a few lessons learned uh, I want to share with you. Um, quickly first, um, who are we? Société Générale, I don't know if it's, it's a French bank, but the investment banking of Société Générale uh, is made of uh, around uh, 22 people in 70, 70 countries. Uh, and within this environment, uh, we've decided to go for a Nigeria scale transformation uh, in 2017. I will just explain the history afterward. But the Nigeria scale transformation was done at the level of the support functions. As you can see on the slide, we have the different business lines of the investment banking. You have the market activity, the financing, uh, global transaction banking, security services, uh, private banking, and asset management, and all the support functions that we call the IT department, the technology, and the support functions that are called, the other support functions that are uh, in the banking called uh, the back offices, uh, were uh, the scope of this transformation. So we are talking about a transformation initially on IT, 7,000 people. We were talking about 7,000 people for the IT departments. Um, first of all, we need to recall why we went to this transformation because we, we did not go uh, uh, to, toward this, this long journey uh, just because uh, the other did. We saw that we had four main drivers. First of all, we thought that it was a good way to enhance the value delivered to the business. Second, we think that this model, the Agile scale model, is more effective to, to deliver uh, uh, either facing business or inside the IT department itself. Third, it's important to have in mind that uh, today uh, we are in a competitive environment and we, we compete with the, um, with the companies that are not banks to attract the new talents. And today you need to have a model which is interesting, interested for the new talent uh, to, to, to get uh, new journals in the bank, uh, top level new journals. And of course, we think that this model uh, is a fit for purpose for innovation, which is, of course, uh, very important uh, and more and more important today. Um, if we take a step back, uh, we, we can go back uh, to uh, the, 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 the Agile Manifesto, just to recall. Um, on what we have based our, our, what I will call our target operating model. Uh, here are the four value drivers uh, of, the, of the Agile. I think uh, most of you know them. What we have done internally before to design uh, the target operating model, we said, okay, how do we translate uh, these, these, uh, these values into things that will help us uh, draft 
our operating model. So we've said, first of all, uh, we want a business alignment of the support function and in particular on the IT to the business. Second, we want all the decision to be value driven, which is something which is not obvious uh, in, in, a, in a banking company. Uh, of course, we want to favor a decentralized uh, decision making process and Societe Generale has a, uh, had an history of uh, quite cascaded uh, decision uh, making process. We want and we need a collective commitment. And to do so, we need 100% transparency of the activity of the IT and the support functions. And of course, we will work, we will put everyone in iterative cycles, which is the, 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 the basic of, uh, of the agility. These are uh, uh, the, the, the following, the principles we followed to draft our operating model. If we, look at um, uh, the, the journey we, we followed. We did not start in 2017. Agility uh, at Societe Generale started, uh, we started by Dolin. Uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, 2011, we started to have some project in Agile. Um, on IT departments, on the uh, operation side, they continued to follow the lean management uh, principles. Uh, on the IT, uh, we, we started uh, in 2011 by this project in Agile. We launched a very ambitious program in 2014 that we call the Continuous Delivery Program um, to enable um, uh, the platform uh, to, to put in production the deliveries that we had that were more and more agile and, uh, and more and more uh, rapid. Uh, and we've decided to go for an Agile landscape transformation in 2017. Then we started this transformation, it, it's three years back. And after one year, one year and a half, we switched to an organizational agility. This is what I will present you today, uh, because uh, agile at scale alone within the IT environment does not suffice. We, we have to embed that in a decision-making process, which is compatible with agility. And this is what we call uh, organizational agility. So as you see, the Agile at Scale program at Societe Generale Investment Banking was more a bottom-up program uh, than a top-down program. It came from uh, the IT, then uh, it has impacted all the support functions and through the uh, organizational agility, it is now impacting uh, the, the whole chain uh, of the activities. Okay, so what is it about? It's about culture and mindset. It's about organization and governance, and it's about method and tooling. First of all, we had to change the mindset uh, of, of people around uh, what is IT development. We had to switch from a client supplier relationship to shared accountability mechanisms. We had to regroup two worlds that were completely independent, the world of the project and the world of the production to have a full ownership by the business of a service uh, which encompass everything production and uh, of course uh, new investments and we had to switch to a view a project view on long-term planning to uh, iterative objectives and to a, a mechanism uh, much more uh, much more uh, iterative then we had to adapt uh, the organization itself uh, to, to welcome uh, an agile way of working. First of all, we had to change what we call the GBSU, the, uh, the support unit governance, uh, so as to uh, enable a delegation at every uh, level of the organization. I will talk about it uh, just afterward. Then we had to switch our way to steer activities. We are, we are switching, it's not yet finalized, we are well advanced, it's not yet finalized. We've switched to a no-care approach. We want people to um, define properly and disclose their objectives rather than to identify the outputs that they want. Uh, then we have to change entirely the way we manage the demand. Uh, to ensure that the, the BU and issue uh, and uh, support unit uh, initiatives are prioritized and steered according to uh, their value and their contribution to the strategy, of course. Um, and 
last element, this can work at the condition that we um, the the resource are not resources are not a mechanism for adjustments. I have a new project, I will adapt new resources. If you do that, it does not work. You go back to a project approach where you think that when you can pay, you can have something, which is of course not the reality on, on the ground. So we've switched to a capacity management approach. Uh, and now we define the capacity at the beginning, beginning of the year. And within this fixed capacity, the business stakeholders, they have to choose what they want, uh, what they want to do. To do so, we had to adapt entirely our tooling uh, suites so as to have tooling to manage our OKR from the top of the, of the investment banking because the OKR are impacting the business from the top of the investment banking to the tribes. Uh, we had to change our portfolio management tool. Uh, we had to extend and to reshuffle the way we were using uh, the execution tool, which is uh, Jira in our context. And we had to uh, implement a tool which is giving a full transparency of on our costs, which is called uh, Apsio uh, in our context. This is the, the all the environment of the of the transformation. In this context, uh, we what did we do? We first aligned uh, the the IT organization and the the support function, no, so IT and uh, oper uh, operations. Uh, with uh, the business value chains. We move from a uh, silo organization between uh, tech and ops to an industrial uh, digital service platform where you have uh, the service platform serving the businesses that I have uh, mentioned uh, just before. So you will find in the gray in the gray box, you find the different uh, activities, the different support functions, and these fun support functions are of course, of course completely aligned with the business functions speeded a little bit on this one. We've put the client at the heart of our governance model. Uh, and we, we have, uh, we've, we've nominated many POs uh, from the business to help us uh, to drive our activity. I, I will not spend time on this one because I want you to understand not this, this one, but the following. Um, if I go back to the governance, what we did is what we call a Russian doll approach. This Russian doll approach is a mechanism whereby uh, the objectives are set at the highest level. This is what you see here, uh, the GBSU support functions, then you have the support unit, then you have the tribe, then you have the team. Uh, each of the governance uh, level, they have their own OKR. They have what we call the emblematic KPIs, which are the element to follow the production, the quality of uh, of what is uh, uh, is um, developed, etc., etc., and they follow line per line a few what we call a few major initiatives. We could talk about epics if we would talk uh, uh, in an agile uh, uh, wording, but uh, it was difficult to have this uh, understood uh, within the company for, by uh, 7,000 people. So we prefer to use the term initiative, but uh, take that as an epic. At their level, at the level of the GBSC support unit, they only follow a few major initiatives. Then at the support unit, uh, uh, major initiative as well. And at tribe level, they have a few major initiatives. And, and this is what is the most important, they have delegation to manage a, a big part of their budget, which is um, delivered through delegated initiatives. And then, uh, of course, at team level, they manage their team backlog. So this cascading mechanism uh, enables uh, the delegation that I've talked about just before. So how, once we've done that, we have uh, the different layers, we have the cascading and the delegation, uh, and how do we operate, uh, operationally speaking? We, we went for a model that we called at the beginning a spotty safe model. It's a mix of Spotify. We've redesigned all the, uh, the teams in tribes. Uh, tribes made of uh, roughly uh, 100 people uh, and made of uh, several, uh, we, call, no, we don't call them squads, we call them feature teams. 
as you can see. Uh, so we, we went for a Spotify model. Uh, and when we have a transversal uh, big project, we apply safe mechanisms. So first of all, let's let's uh, uh, stop uh, at the at our organization in terms of uh, operating model. Made of so with seven thousand people, we have roughly seventy tribes. It's a little bit less, but roughly uh, seventy tribes. All these tribes are split into uh, into feature teams made of seven to nine people. They are all aligned with a, what we call a product, and they are they are referring to a product owner. Really, an element which is key in our uh, in our deployment is the fact that we have insisted to have the product owner from the business. There is no professional product owner in our model, so it's not Spotify by the book. Our decision was to say uh, if we want a product owner to cover all aspects of what a feature team uh, is supposed to deliver from new project to the production to the support, etc., etc. They have to be uh, in front of the business. Uh, so they have to belong to the business. So in our model, uh, the product owner spends 20 to 25% of his time with the, uh, with, uh, with the tribe and the rest of, the, of his time uh, uh, is dedicated to, um, dedicated to his, his real world real work sorry so first of all uh, toward the business we have the product owner and second to steer the activity of a tribe it's done uh, via a concept that we've taken out from uh, from safe which is the concept of pmt a product management team because we noticed that in our environment in the banking environment we were not able to have a product owner leading a tribe of 100 people. We need different skills, etc. It's not possible to have only one person. So we put a few people together from the front office, some trader responsible of desk, uh, people like that, people from the back offices, etc. Uh, we put them together and we organize uh, their, their, their work so that together with the tribe manager, they can steer the priorities of the tribe. So the tribe is a Spotify tribe with vertical feature teams. Last element I want you to keep in mind in our model, we don't have vertical management anymore. Of course, we have the tribe manager, who's the manager of the tribe, but, but we have switched the, the management horizontally. So it's the chapters that you have here that are managers of the people in the tribes. And this is very important because when you do that, you enable the feature team to be really autonomous and you have no intermediary between the business and the guys in the feature team. I need to speed up a little bit, sorry, I'm a little bit late. So uh, you have the key roles here, but I will not have time to go through these key roles. I have mentioned the, the two main from the business, the product management team, which is from the business and the PO. Uh, and of course, in terms of management, the prime manager and the chapter manager. Uh, just one word maybe to say that how do we manage the architecture um, uh, consistency? We have a league, an architecture league, which is organized, which is uh, upper to uh, several tribes. And, and that's the same for the production uh, aspects. And this is, this enables to manage uh, all the, the priorities, all the developments that are coming to a tribe directly, uh, that are flowing to a tribe. This is how do we synchronize the, the, the activity? We have a demand, an initiative coming, and if it can go to one feature team, we call that the single feature team model. So it's purely Spotify. You have something coming to a product. You have a product owner deciding the prioritization, etc. It goes into the feature team, but it does not work if you need to, if you have uh, initiatives that are cross tribes or that are complicated to deliver. In, the, in this case, we have two models. On the right hand side, we can put in place when we have a lot of feature teams, we put in place safe trains to coordinate the activity of all the feature teams working for given initiatives. Of course, these feature teams, they belong to a given tribe, but they put together their forces to deliver something in the context of a safe train. And of course, you can have in all the intermediate level that you can imagine because between one feature team and a train of, we have trains up to uh, 15, 16, 18 feature teams. In the middle, you can have initiative where you need 
a few features seem to be coordinated. In, in this case, we do what we call the light sync, which is a kind of a scrum of scrum or, thing, or things like that. Sorry to speed up because uh, we are almost done. Um, with this model, so spotty safe model applied to IT, um, organizational agility applied to the whole organization and to have all the processes compatible with an agile scale model. Uh, we found very uh, excellent objectives in terms of uh, business and IT satisfaction. Um, in terms of time to market, even if the time to market is always difficult to assess, we have a very good time to market and we had a dramatic increase of the time to market. And we had a lot of efficiency gains as well because this model for sure reduces the number of intermediate layer, uh, the pyramidal aspect of the organization, etc. Last, the feedbacks and the lessons that I would like to share with you. Um, we, quite, we are quite happy with the transformation that we've made. We are already at 80% uh, of the tribes uh, transformed today. Uh, the whole organization has been transformed. We think we've managed to do that uh, uh, around uh, on uh, more than 7,000 people because we had a structured program with a holistic approach from the beginning. We did not launch initiatives of a JDT, even if uh, before to launch the program, we had two of them. But once we've decided to go, we had a structured program. Uh, then we've defined a set of clear objectives of indicators of uh, the benefits of the agility. We have more than 17 indicators that are followed to see the progress uh, of, uh, of, the, of our organization. Um, we started bottom up, as I've shown you, uh, by the IT. Uh, but with the organizational agility, we we, we connected with the top-down uh, approach, so we think that there is, it does not matter if it's bottom-up or top-down uh, approach. Uh, we need, what is important is to embark the business from the start. We, it, we did not do a top-down transformation, but we embarked the business with the POs and the PMTs from the start. Um, the other element is that we don't have a, a one single model. We have adapted the different model to build our own target operating model with people from uh, Société Générale working on the different patterns, etc. Uh, we have, as I've shown you uh, very quickly, transformed all the steering processes. This is what we call the organizational agility, all the steering process, and it's a big part of the transformation. And of course, we this had an impact, a huge impact on the people so we build a, a very important HR stream to accompany the deep managerial and cultural change uh, uh, in, the, in the investment banking. I think I'm a little bit late, sorry for that. that that's great, Etienne, thank you, that, that, that's fine. I'm gonna assume that uh, Peter will take over and uh, we are doing the, the Q&A for this in a panel session after Peter's presentation, so, uh, don't go away, Etienne. We have uh, questions for you on the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Um, Fidelity, you know, financial services is a financial services firm uh, in the U.S. About um, you know nine trillion um, U.S. dollars of assets on the management. About forty-five thousand associates, um, and the personal investing business unit really is the business unit that deals with the B2C part of, of the um, organization. Uh, what I'm gonna do is actually click down a little bit on, on how we adapted um, you know, agile architecture as a part of our transformation. So what's quite fascinating is, and, and probably not unusual, is a lot of the elements that Etienne spoke to very similar to uh, our own transformational journey. Interestingly enough, and I wasn't aware of this before, we, we, we started actually in 2017 but that was as a result of a number of previous incremental attempts where we didn't actually do a holistic mashup of the business and technology. We had elements like capability teams, um, you know, we were doing agile in technology, but there wasn't a real comprehensive mashup between the business and technology along all of the, the roles and responsibilities. So, you know, we have come into 2017 with that learning. And then we made a decision in about August of 2017 
that we couldn't be half agile as a business unit. So the personal investing business unit um, consists of about uh, 19,000 associates. Um, 14,000 of those associates are in regional centers, um, call centers and branches. 5,000 are what we call home office. So this transformation is really in home office. Um, and that consisted of about 2,500 associates in, in what we might call core business functions and then another 2,500 in technology. And so when I say mashup, it was really taking 5,000 people and fully integrating them uh, into, again, interestingly enough, the Spotify model. Uh, and we made a decision actually that we would flash cut the organization. We feel we felt we had enough learnings, so we, um, you know, we notified the organization in in uh, August of 2017. Educated the organization in uh, September of 2017 that we were going to do this and what it meant. And then in October, November, and December of 2017, uh, we literally in three ways. Uh, flash cut the entire organization into a set of domains. Domains simply align um, to the um, elements of our strategy, uh, tribes, squads. And then as Etienne mentioned before, we likewise have uh, chapters that are orthogonal um, to the tribe and squad structure. So for example, architecture is a chapter. I'm an architecture chapter area leader. Um, sitting below me are architecture um, chapter leaders, and they are get aligned um, specifically with domains, tribes, and squads, and that's where they live in those cross-functional teams. The rationale for the transformation, um, you heard a bit of that from at the end, um, very, very similar, um, delivering faster value to our customers, um, and, and really energizing and engaging um, associates um, much more holistically. Um, empowering our dedicated teams, and then, and then, um, for us, and you'll see this in subsequent slide, we really recognize that there are some fundamental cultural changes we wanted to make in the organization, as it's related to delivering customer value faster, um, and that was related to uh, a model of leadership that was much more empowering and multiplying, and then, of course, um, you know, to stimulate innovation. I would say that, um, you know, because we had some prior experiences with this, and I'm sure, um, you know, others have too. I heard Brian mention that a little bit, and probably Etienne. Uh, the fundamental chasm we were trying to cross was, the, you know, the semantic gap between um, technology's use of Agile and the business seeing Agile as a, uh, a, a primary contributor to delivering value delivering value to customers very quickly, and then alignment uh, between IT investment and overall business strategy. And so for us, the whole issue of, of mindset um, was very, very fundamental um, to what we were, we were getting after. Um, Self-directing teams, absolutely. It's part of this, this whole notion of empowering. Uh, we wanted deeper collaboration that wasn't simply ad hoc and episodic, but actually was baked into um, BAU, you know, business as usual, standard modus operandi. Uh, you know, Brian focused a lot on the value stream and, 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 and we wanted um, that co those combined teams to really have clarity regarding the specific customer outcomes that were associated with the business strategy. And then we wanted to integrate to a continuous learning and improvement model into the organization. So apart from, um, you know, instantiation of the Spotify model, the associated tooling, um, you know, we, we, we likewise use um, OKPR model, OKR model with, uh, you know, what we call OKPIs um, so that we can measure in, in a very quantitative manner what's actually happening. Um, we use um, what was formerly called Agile Craft, it's now called Jira Line, um, to deal with the holistic structure of initiative, epics, et cetera. And more importantly, we like uh, Jira Line um, because it links directly into Jira. 
so that there can be a very direct click down uh, into the actual work being done by squads, sprint stories, et cetera, et cetera. And there's no need to actually um, uh, manually look at that. But the other thing we've integrated is we've taken 20% um, of every week. So we call Tuesdays learning days. And uh, you know, all members of the organization are actually allowed um, to use that day either collaboratively um, or otherwise for specific areas of, of continuous learning. So fundamental changes that we wanted to make in the culture. This didn't exist before. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, um, for us, really driving some leadership principles with holistic accountability, right? Um, I think, you know, Etienne mentioned this um, also, but we wanted to be very explicit uh, about those principles. And those principles actually are broad-based fidelity financial services leadership principles. Um, but they're also baked in, of course, to personal investing. So what happened after the personal investing business unit began this transformational journey, um, Abby Johnson, who is the uh, chairperson of the company, um, about eight or nine months in, she made the decision that all of Fidelity, all of the other business units, would um, would would go into uh, this this transformation, this type of transformation. On the right side of the slide, you can see um, for us um, part of what we did in that flash cut model I mentioned in three months is we actually had everybody reapply for their jobs. And um, so you went through a 360 um, review, you went through a face-to-face -face interview, and then uh, there was your profile regarding what you'd contributed previously. And what we were really looking for were really uh, individuals who um, you know, demonstrated multiplying behaviors, as you see here. And we were quite frankly trying to um, you know, um, minimize, I would say, diminish your risk, quite frankly, right? Because we felt that this was really critical to actually operationalizing the transformation on the ground. Um, very similar, uh, you know, Spotify model, uh, tribes, squads, uh, um, chapters. We do have center of excellences, and, and those for us are constructs that are intended to uh, look ahead um, in areas that we feel are complementary to our overall strategy. Um, and we, want, we use those, those center of excellences to accelerate uh, the overall validation um, strategy standards that will subsequently then be utilized within the domains, uh, tribes and squads. So for example, within my architecture chapter area, I actually have an architecture center of excellence. Their, their current focus has been, over the last 12 months, we utilize uh, Amazon Web Services and they were front running for us, along with an enterprise uh, you know, uh, cloud computing organization, our instantiation of Azure because we wanted a, uh, a multi-cloud uh, you know, multi strategy. Um, chapters. Um, Fundamentally, you know, um, they're, they're squad members with similar expertise, i.e. architects, and they drive consistency and what good looks like um, into um, those chapters. I will say that within our instantiation of the Spotify model, we actually use squad leaders. So the hierarchy is domain, tribes, squad, squad leaders, and then chapters, and they provide the orthogonal resource so that a, a squad leader actually functions um, as the individual who is accountable for leveraging all of the uh, resources within that squad um, to deliver the appropriate um, feature function that would be um, you know, the, a, a component of what the tribe was, was trying to deliver and of course what the domain is delivering. Now, as part of our evolution, we're seeing more and more that those squad leaders actually um, um, need to be either complemented with or they need competencies um, of product management competencies. And that's, and that's part of an uh, evolution that um, we're currently in the midst of.
Centers of Excellence, I think I've talked uh, a bit about that, so I'm not going to say much more. And then, um, you know, chapter leaders, um, they basically um, are responsible for uh, the, um, you know, the, literally the care, feeding, and, and, and career development of uh, members um, within, that, within that chapter. Um, and, you know, from an architecture perspective, uh, here are some of the things that they're specifically um, you know, responsible for in terms of the technical role of the architect, their design skills, their programming skills, communication skills, um, um, et cetera. One of the things that we found was that once we had actually instantiated this model, um, we needed to make sure that there was clarity of vocabulary and semantics, even though many of our colleagues who primarily were um, you know, focus on, on, on the business, had had contact with architecture, we needed now to be very, very, very clear about roles, responsibility, and, and meaning. And so I'm a really big fan of the, you know, the two Peters, Peter Eccles and Peter Cripps, uh, and they've got a very nice model in, in, in their book uh, that speaks about what, what does an architect actually do, what is actually architecting, and what is architecture. And so we use this, this particular model so that domain leaders, tribe leaders, squad leaders, and chapter members have a very consistent vocabulary and understanding of the role, responsibilities, and activities um, of, of the architects and the architecture chapter members um, within, you know, within the constructs. We also, um, you know, again, go back to the notion of being very clear about um, collaborative behavior, leadership behavior, mindset. Um, we've articulated very, you know, very clearly um, the engagement principles upon which we, uh, along which we practice architecture, right? Uh, and again, you know, Brian, um, in his first presentation on business architecture, mentioned a number of these things, right? Uh, staying in the business context, uh, focusing on outcomes, layering the conversation. Um, uh, we, you know, we use the uh, C4 model for simplifying architectural artifacts so that all of the constituent stakeholders in the collaboration, uh, you know, understand um, what's, what's going on. Um, and then, and then other elements of um, how we actually practice architecture. But our fundamental learning is that we would like to infuse architectural thinking into all roles within the model. Clearly, not everyone is an architect, but we want architectural thinking infused because we think it's it's very fundamental to um, you know how one um, effectively leverages. Uh, you know, the model, I think, that, um, that that Brian showed, right, in terms of uh, the business model, the business strategy, the associated business model, right, the business architecture, uh, and, and, and we view architecture as a necessary complement um, to that business architecture. So we want architectural thinking uh, infused in, in all of the associates within the collaboration. And, and then, um, you know, to go even further, um, we get very explicit about what we mean by end-to-end -end, uh, architectural solution. Uh, and, you know, great presentation, uh, first presentation today from Brian around business architecture. Um, we are particularly, because of our key objectives around um, the evolution, you know, for financial services, right, um, which is clearly being driven by what we call the digital natives, digital giants, digital dragons. Um, there is the recognition that the experience that they deliver um, really um, provides customers with a coherent um, set of journeys. And those journeys are usually very strongly um, correlated across the various tasks within the journey, vis-a-vis -vis the customer's desired outcome. So, um, you know, we wanted to be really, really explicit about that. And so uh, what you see in this slide is how we've, is how we've articulated that. Um, we are three years in. Um, I think, um, you know, a lot of the OKPIs um, or OKRs um, have proven um, 
that our initial aspirations and objectives are being realized. And so we are now uh, in a phase where we are uh, evolving our overall architectural strategy. So for example, we made a deliberate decision in the early days of the strategy not to uh, perturb uh, a number of the horizontal components, right? And so um, those components would be things like um, uh, existing platforms or aggregations of capabilities um, that behaved like platforms um, and or um, our underlying data architecture. Um, we have now been pushing along in those dimensions, um, specifically uh, with respect to data, as we, I would say, drive very hard now for what we feel is the fundamental infrastructural pivot of the underlying architecture. I mean, I have a hypothesis that says everything below the experience layer will commoditize. And the rationale for that is, is really quite simple. Um, you know, I think that the CSPs, the cloud service providers, um, are providing managed services and fundamental technology capabilities at a very, very rapid rate. And therefore, there's the ability to leverage all of that to, um, you know, build architectures that in many cases, um, you know, we have to build very complex um, systems to, to actualize. And so we recognize that a, 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 a truly digital experience requires a fundamental um, data strategy, right? And uh, Andreessen um, Horowitz have got a very nice paper on emerging architectures for data infrastructure, for modern data infrastructure. And they articulate three, three particular models, right? They call one a multimodal model, um, an analytical and, and, and ML model and an operational model. And the multimodal model is a convergence of that analytic model um, and the operational model. And so, um, you know, we are, are pushing very aggressively in that direction. Um, and, and, you know, versus um, the way we thought about data architectures before, uh, we think that there is a much more holistic perspective around business need technology, you know, clearly security, cybersecurity, legal risk, cost, and governance that need to be a part of that overall strategy and then manifested in the actual architecture itself. Um, as, as policies, automated policies and not manual um, policies and procedures. And so we've got a, a you know, complementary data governance construct that's associated with that part of um, you know, our transformation with all of the um, elements that you would, would expect around accountability, quality, life cycle management, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this slide is just really a, um, a model of, of how we've organized um, to, to, to actually um, you know, accomplish those objectives. You'll notice that um, when John read the introduction, he mentioned this TAG group, uh, and that's a grouping of all of the um, chief architects, CTOs in the firm, um, and uh, that has a working group called the TAG Data Council. By the way, that construct is, we do not have an enterprise architecture organization. Uh, the firm previously had one, our, you know, we operate in a fully federated IT model. And what that means is that all CIOs report directly to the presidents of business units. We do not have an enterprise CIO, we have an enterprise CTO, and they're dotted line to that individual. And then we use the, this tag construct to um, create coherence across all of the architectural activities going, going on in the various business units. And the rationale for that is we wanted uh, much more control and prioritization um, driven out of the business units and not out of um, the center of the organization. And then the final piece, um, I think this is my second to last slide, is that we, we've now, um, you know, one of the most, um, I think perturbing things to me is if you, if you get into a conversation about platforms, you can spend close to a year um, trying to define what is a platform. Uh, and we were no different with respect to that, but we recognize that, you know, for us, quite frankly, it's an aggregation of logical capabilities and the logic around the capabilities are what's the intended use of those capabilities. 
And because of the kinds of managed services that are available now in the cloud, we wanted to, we view this as a very critical construct in our architecture. And so we wanted to be really, really um, highly opinionated about this so that, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of swirl. Um, so this is now a um, big push in terms of our evolution. Um, going from really, you know, undefined and ambiguous to really being very clearly um, defined, highly aligned capabilities, very, very um, clear product management around those platforms, and then, um, you know, holistic platforms um, enabling end-to-end um, uh, -end transformation with very tight alignment and clarity around uh, their contribution within a value stream. Um, this is a generic model, actually came from a McKinsey paper um, that we use when we think of um, our platform ecosystem. Um, and then uh, the connection to architecture is the following. It's actually the last bullet on the left, lower left. Um, there is, you know, once, once you get to this, um, you know, notion of platforms, and, 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 you know, hopefully one is addressing the issue of duplicative capabilities, right? Um, and then the issue really then becomes what we call the city planning function, which is we've extended our architectural accountability to now look across domains. Recall, I'm talking about a single business unit. Um, and so the business strategy for that business unit, personal investing, is actually quite coherent. And so we want the, um, you know, corresponding architectural strategy and um, its output to be coherent across the domains, tribes, and squads. And so we've extended the architectural practice uh, to actually include this notion of city planning. So a set of my architecture chapter leaders with um, some tribe leaders now form this city planning function and their role is to make sure, is to ensure that we're thinking holistically across domains, across tribes, uh, about our platform ecosystem and, and the associated capability. And that's a, um, that is actually an in-flight part of our evolution, even as we speak. That's it. <laughs>